Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part time musician who wants to go full time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. On the Profitable Musician Show, we give you practical tips and strategies to increase the income you're already making and tap into new streams so you can create more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. We also help you think like a business owner so you can keep more of the money that you make. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, author of the best-selling book, The Musician's Profit Path, and host of the popular Profitable Musician Summit. And as you can probably tell, I am obsessed with helping musicians like you to build a rock solid fan base and income foundation so you can fund the music you are driven to create, share your message with the world, and fulfill your God-given purpose as a musician without stressing out about where your next dollar is gonna come from. You've got the talent. You just need the marketing and business tools to take it to the next level. Now let's dive in to the Profitable Musician Show. Welcome everyone. I am excited to be talking to Rory Gardner today. We're going to talk about so many subjects because he is so well-rounded. He is a multifaceted artist and what I love about kind of his platform is that he talks about being able to be an artist while being well balanced as far as balancing your work and your life, your family and your art, you know, all those things, because we are almost multifaceted people. So we will get into that. But first, I would love to have you, Rory, just let them know a little bit of your background, how you got involved in music, what you've kind of done in your career over the years up till now. That's thank you. Good intro. Um, And I'm probably well rounded because it's COVID weight. It's mostly COVID weight. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I got into music, I don't know, like 20 years ago, like everybody, I wanted to become a rock star and did that for a while. And through that stumbling block, I, I guess I, I did a few licensing things here or there, had some cool shows here or there. I didn't think I was creating much value, uh, in the music scene. I'd be doing these, uh, these theater shows and like, I'd love to, you know, talk in between songs, tell jokes, reconnect with the audience between that. And then it got to a point where I was like, you know what? I can't wait for the song to be over so I can talk to the audience in between songs. So, you know, maybe I'll try stand up comedy. So uh, while continuing with music, I decided to do stand up comedy as well. So for seven years later, uh, stand up comedy world uh, still, uh, prevalent in my life and same sort of thing happened with that I'd be telling jokes about um, God knows what just to make people laugh I didn't think I was offering any value to anybody until 2018 my house got hit with this uh, tornado and I created a a a video just an entertaining funny outlook kind of like a cribs parody on the damage to the home and ended up going viral it got the attention of the the TED people that were at TED Talks. And we'd love to talk to you about your interpretation of, you know, creating humor around a, a serious subject. So I went and did this uh, TED Talk in Colorado in 2019. And, um, you know, it was just basically an eight minute comedy routine, but with value. And that thing gets shared at PTSD conferences and yeah, as therapists use it to treat their trauma patients it's as an example of sublimation, replacing a negative situation with a good one. And uh, and that's, you know, recently it's the first time I realized that I guess what I do with an entertainer uh, finally has value. Mm, that's interesting. So has that kind of spilled over into your music as well? Like you, you realized a, a little bit more that your music has value? Yeah, it, it's, it's the music has always been prevalent, and you know, while we're still doing these uh, these jokes, we're, we're creating music, and I find that uh, my music shifts with whatever happens to be going on in my own life. So it started out 
as a country musician and still a country musician to this day, but the weather changes. So somewhere around 2012, I decided it's time to have kids. Uh, it wasn't only my decision, obviously, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we, uh, we had kids and I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't write country songs anymore. I, I we watched it, my entire life was Sesame Street. So I decided uh, I, I can't take this music. I can write my own music, whether it's better or worse, I'm going to take a crack at it. So for the last few years, I've been writing children's music and now I've got three of those albums out. And uh, it's fun. This is a basically a fusion of, of, of my interpretation of, of <laughs> parenting kids and country music. No, I love that because we as musicians, we do tend to like process through our music and it tends to be a little bit of therapy for us as well. And like for you that, you know, that's just the part of life that you were in and you were, you know, you were interpreting that through your own lens, which I think is awesome. Plus you're creating value for other people's kids and, you know, also for yourself, not having to listen to the music that you didn't like that your kids were listening to and making something better. Exactly. That's awesome. I love that. So I would love to talk about, I know you are big on work life balance. And so I'd love to know like this whole time where you were making music and, you know, going and touring and things like that, were you also working a day job and how were you balancing all that with your family? Well, it's, it's a loaded question. Like it's so yes and no, I, I have seasons where I, let's say I'll, I'll create for a, a very long period of time, let's say six months, and then I'll burn out. I'll, I'll, <laughs> it's like I run out of ideas. And so I need a shift, like something else to, uh, to create. I kind of have to like, create an adversity because I think that fuels the creativity. So then I, you know, my education's in software. I decided to uh, go back and do some consulting. And so like the first day on the job, it's like, oh my God, I wrote like three songs because I got it's like in your mind, it's like this prison. I got to get out of this like cubicle wall. <laughs> so you kind of write your way out of it. And I, you know, I've been doing that on and off for, uh, for over a decade, just um, taking, taking contracts when I run out of creative ideas, because it, it honestly resets like a reset switch basically. That is pretty uh, interesting. That's like tapping into our whole mentality of like the grass is always greener or something, you know, we, when we're, when we're home and we're able to do writing and we have that time, then we have this like block, but then when you, someone's keeping you from doing the writing, then all of a sudden you get this burst of creativity. That's right. It's like a <laughs> perceived adversity. That's uh, so interesting. I find that like it's, and people, they, they, they gun for that full-time artist thing so quickly and sometimes too quickly and they don't realize that maybe that isn't exactly what it is they want to do. So I, I've done that. I've gone down that road at a publishing deal where I had to write songs every day. I had to fill a quota and you realize pretty quickly, you don't want to write songs every day. Yeah. At the parties, you could tell people you're a full-time artist, but that life sucks. All right. I, I love playing live. I, I, but not every day of the week. I did that and I played pubs. I play weddings. I play private events six or seven days a week. And you, you find out pretty quickly, you burn out of that too. So finding the balance of, there are easier ways to make money. Like you don't need to monetize your art. In fact, I think it stifles your art when you try to monetize it. Like if you play gigs in pubs or weddings or wherever it happens to be seven days a week, the last thing you want to do the next morning is pick up a guitar and write new music. Mm. So why wouldn't you try to balance that with something? Let's just say a day job something that requires a little bit more linear thinking as opposed to creative thinking. That way you have some fuel at the end of the day to, to write whatever it is you want. That's an interesting perspective. And I know most musicians, you know, their eventual goal is to do it full time. But I think this will really speak to our, the people that li listen and watch the show that know, you know, they like their day job. I hear from plenty of people that like their day job, um, and they just love music and they want to do it. And on the side, they want to keep, you know, bringing in enough income to keep doing the music, right? Because we, we do have to have that money there. We can't just have it be the sinkhole of money. So did you find that, you know, you were always trying to balance like, okay, I need to make enough money over here so I can keep doing this thing over here. It's a perception change. Like just because 
you create, you have money coming in on this other source, it doesn't make you any less of an artist. It, it doesn't, there's so much easier ways to make money than being an artist, but creating art is what you do. It's not necessarily what you have to do to, to create your primary income. Uh, I find that if you change your perception with that, like it's just consider your, your day job, like a sponsor for your creativity. Do you know what I mean? Instead of making it stifle, uh, you know, it's treated as a, as an opportunity. Like you have this competitive advantage now over the people slinging it away in, in bars and, and doing their thing. You have a little extra money that you could throw at studio time or uh, video production or advertising and, um, and you create the balance that way. I love that idea of thinking of your job as a sponsor of your art. Like that makes a lot of sense. I know when I was, um, you know, in my early days of my career and trying to figure stuff out and I was in this band and I was working full time at the opera as a director of finance. And I had the ability to like, because I was at the executive level, I could reorganize my schedule and be like, I'm going to work from seven to three. So then I could go to band practice and still be home to be with, you know, my family and stuff. And it did feel like, you know, that company was sponsoring my band because they were enabling me to be able to do that, to have the kind of flexibility and, and money to be able to invest in equipment and stuff that I needed. And then like actually all the people at the company, like they knew I was leaving at three every day and where I was going. And so when we were doing, you know, our first shows, I was able to get them all to come because they're like, they feel like they were a part of it. Yeah. That's cool. I just, I love that kind of. It's hard to tell the person, they don't tell your employer that they're sponsoring your band. You don't want to do that. Right. <laughs> well, actually, you know, being on the executive team, I did have to go to the executive director and say, Hey, this is what I want to do with my schedule. And here's why. And being that it was an, you know, it was an opera company. So they understood like artistic needs and stuff. And they're like, as long as it doesn't affect what you're doing, I don't care if you change your hours you know, if you're going to be more productive in those hours, if you're going to feel more creativity, you know, creatively fulfilled, then he was happy to let me do it. I think it just positions you in a different way in which it allows you to be more experimental. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to fit in this box because you need to monetize that creativity, let's say you're you need to learn these top 40 songs because you need to pay rent at the end of the month. Uh, you're less likely to learn some of the experimental songs or create some of the more experimental music that you want to, because no one's going to hire you uh, to play those songs. And so it's, I mean, if you have the flexibility to have income coming in from other sources, then you, you're kind of free to create whatever it is you want. Right. I agree. And it also takes the stress off. I know occasionally I'll have people come and join my academy and they'll be like, well, can I get this up and running in three, you know, two to three months? Cause I have to have a full-time income by then. And I'm like, like you can, <laughs> like if you really work hard, but you can't ever guarantee that you can't guarantee that the fans are going to love your music, that the fans are going to support you, that your music is good enough to, be able to draw a full-time income. Like I, I cannot give you that guarantee. And to put that kind of pressure on yourself where like, I have to make this money uh, is again, like you said, going to stifle your creativity. So I, but, I'm glad we're having this conversation. Well, that's where you need to reevaluate what you're doing. I, like it sounds like in that scenario, they want to create money doing music because they hate their job. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, uh, find a different job. <laughs> I mean, don't, don't make music the thing that's going to get you out of that particular job. I just, I told you five minutes ago, I've done music full time. I I've, I've, I've created jingles. I've done every sort of thing you could think of in the, like to create money in music. And it, I wasn't happy. I found it. Look at like Albert Einstein, for example, he had a day job in a patent office. He did that all day. And it was a linear job. Like it didn't use any of his creativity. He basically just did that all day so that he could focus on his experiments and his theory of relativity all night. Uh, if he had, you know, if he was trying to be creative all the time, if he was doing pharmaceutical work and creating beakers here or there all day, he probably didn't want to do that at night. So it's just having that balance 
is, is what helps you out. And your day job, assuming maybe depending on what you do, that might make more money than Spotify streams at first. Do you know what I mean? And so use that. I remember back 20 years ago, no, it wasn't 20 years ago, maybe 2008, I decided to level up my thing. I, I was doing uh, recording in, in studios around locally. And I decided, you know what, I've, I've got to level it up. I got to go to Nashville. I'm a country musician. Let's go where all the country musicians are. So I did that. I used all the same session players that are on Reba McIntyre's album and Shania Twain, Tim McGraw, Blake Shelton's album, all that. It sounded incredible because I was positioning myself in that environment where I could create the best album I could. I wouldn't have had that opportunity if I didn't have income coming from, from a different source, right? No, no bar band can afford to do that at first because they're too busy trying to pay their other expenses. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a really good point. And when you talk about leveling up and getting to that pro level, I think people think like in order to be quote, a pro musician, you have to be doing it full time. And it sounds like that is not the way that you're thinking about it. No, you just need to basically compare your, do, do what pros do and position yourself differently. So if you're, I was told back then, like you're no longer competing with the people in your local network. You're now competing with Garth Brooks. <laughs> you're competing with Blake Shelton. You're competing with everyone else on contemporary radio. So you need to sound as good or better, or as you know, you don't have to be better. Just be unique. Just be at that same quality level as they are. Well, and also if you're competing at that level, then you have to have the kind of services backing you up that they have if you want to actually compete, right? You're going to have to hire a PR firm and all that stuff. Did you do that kind of stuff with that record? Funny enough, I didn't. And so I released that album back in 2009. I released a single. This was going to be my big break. I had a, It sounded great. Everything was lined up. It was all good. I released it and it completely flopped at radio. It didn't, uh, it didn't do as well as I thought. And this is before Spotify and all sort of stuff, right? So uh, I thought it was a failure and I kind of just left it on the shelf. I put it up on YouTube. Everyone have at it, go enjoy it. And then a year goes by and I get this call from this ad company in New York. They're like, hey, we, uh, we love your song and we'd love to use it in this campaign uh, for one of our products. And I, I thought it was a crank call. So I hung up on them. And then uh, luckily they called back <laughs> and, uh, and we made a deal happen. So they, you know, they, they wanted to use the song. I'm like, cool, send me the 11 cents when you play it. And, and I'll be happy to, uh, to tell people that you're my songs and your, and your thing. Anyway, they sent me a check for like 50 grand or something like that. <laughs> and they, you know, that was for a licensing for like a year. And then they continued to renew it year after year. And I can't, I'm like, well, there's a, there's a, there might be something here. So then I <laughs> dug into that world. I started releasing the rest of my catalog to uh, other licensing things and, you know, ended up paying for, for cars, houses, the whole thing. And it's, uh, again, it was lucrative at the time, but it's not why I got into music. I, I don't want to write songs about hamburgers and pickup trucks. I want to write songs about what I want to write about, which goes back to the balance thing of I'd rather, uh, you know, have my income coming from somewhere else. If it means I can create whatever it is I want and not create songs about, uh, you know, whatever. Yeah. Whatever they want you to write. Yeah. I exactly. know my, my friend, Michael Elsner talks about that too, when he was working, you know, for American Idol and had to create like bumpers and he only had like an hour to do it. And, you know, just that like stress that they put on your creativity, or he didn't want to have to write songs, like you said, for a particular product or, you know, whatever they're looking, a certain, you know, uh, brief or whatever of what they're looking for in a song. He wanted to write what he wanted to write and then find somebody else that wanted it for licensing opportunities. And he's done really well with that. So sounds like you have as well. Yeah. But again, I'm trying to get people to separate their, their life from their, from their art. So it's like, create what you want to create, create whatever makes you happy, but don't make it like, I'm, like he's, he's, he's got this thing for, for American Idol, but is he, is that what he wants to do? Like, I, I don't know if, if yeah, it's what he turned loves. Out it wasn't what he wanted to do. So he <laughs> left. Yeah. I don't know. So at that party, when people ask like, what do you do? He can say, yeah, I do that. And only that cool. You're the coolest guy in the room, but are you the happiest guy in the room? Mm. Probably not. Mm, I really like that. 
Yeah, it's, it's very true. And I mean, that's why you, you have your podcast, the balanced artist podcast. That's the name of it, right? Yeah. It's, and the things I talk about are kind of, it, it, it could be polarizing because it changes the mindset of so many <laughs> people. Like really, this is, that's not what I signed up for, but now it's, it's allowing you to kind of change your perception of what being a full-time versus part-time versus balanced artist is. Mm. Yeah, I like that. And I know when I first started helping musicians, I would always say like, make a full-time income from music. And over the years, I realized that that's not what everybody wants. It's not right for everybody. Not everybody wants to work full-time in music. They want to be fulfilled in the music that they do. And they want to be able to make enough money to keep doing that. <laughs> and so that's kind of the language that I use now. And I'm, I'm really focused on helping people bring in different streams of income so they don't have to rely on one thing. So when, you know, COVID shuts down all the events, they're not total. that's, they haven't relied entirely on that stream of income. And it sounds like you've done that as well. You know, you've got licensing income and you perform and you, you know, have Spotify and all that stuff. What, what do you feel are your like biggest, other than your day job, what are your biggest like three or four streams of income that relate to music? It's funny you mentioned like the pandemic was a big eye opener for, for a lot of people with that. It's like, a, again, you, you resent your day job up until the time that you're no longer able to do your art. And now you you're blessed and you're grateful that you have this thing to, to rely on. I remember another part of gratitude when I was in my early twenties, which seems like a long time ago. Uh, I thought I was going to go on this world tour. Cause I, that's, that's the way you think when you're twenties. Mm -hmm. And so I, I bought, um, I bought my first house because I thought like, while I'm on the road making no money, at least I could build equity back home. And, you know, I had roommates in there and they were paying all my expenses. So I could do music essentially full time without having to worry about living and eating. The world tour never happened, but now I had this, this house and, you know, a couple of years ago by equity builds in this house, I buy another house. And now it's a rental unit. A couple of years go by, more equity. And I just built this fleet of income properties. So now that I'm 40, I have this, this passive income coming in. I, I could, if I wanted to, literally uh, do music full time mm -hmm. um, because I, I built that back in the day. But it's, again, that's not exactly how I'm creative. I've, I've gone months and months and months of just trying to write and be creative. And then you just, you hit this wall where it's like, you need to do something to shake things up a little bit. And again, back. So I guess so I pick up a contract. I need this day job to like be out in the world and experiencing things and, and trying to you know feel myself with this again, perceived adversity. That's that so interesting. Your, it's a, it's a, I know it's a weird answer to your question, but it, <laughs> it's, I'm a weird dude. Yeah. <laughs> well, that is true. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that does, I, 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 that's really interesting how you've built up kind of that asset that's working in the background, that recurring income, which is, which is awesome. Um, in relation to music, what, what are your streams of income? So it depends on the, on the, on the year. So right. if, if we've got singles out, uh, there, there's revenue there. So I, I found personally with me, I haven't locked down Spotify yet. Um, we, we do okay, but it's not uh, the primary source. I, I find like a serious XM does, does well because I do um, uh, a lot of the comedy stuff, the comedy songs I write uh, get, get spins there. And some of the children's music I write gets spins there. They have a, they have a great show. And uh, some of the licensing stuff is still creating residuals. So when that gets played you get your quarterly checks for that and uh live is why i got into the music industry so uh performing live is my favorite thing i like to uh perform uh, you know locally when i can because I, I like tuck my kids in at night during the winter months when there's not a global pandemic happening we go to florida i play retirement communities down there i play festivals uh, to try to get into the sun. We're up here in Canada right now. It's it's a very depressing 
time up here in the winter. So I like to try to uh, book my tours around uh, other people's summers. In 2016, I did a, a tour of Australia during their summer because I had to get the hell out of Dodge. And I always wanted to tour Australia. I just visit it in general as a, as a tourist. So if I, if I book a tour there, then <laughs> perfect. I could be, get paid to travel. Sounds good to me. So do you actually go down to Florida for months at a time? Yep. Okay. And then what do you do? Like, do you, do you have still your house? Do you just have someone like house sitting or something for you? Yeah, exactly. So okay. it's, um, yeah, it, it depends on the, on the situation. Like I can't, it's, it's hard to, cause I only go down for the winters. So you can't really rent it out for two months. Like people usually want to rent it long term. So if I, if I can create enough uh, income doing the, the gigs in Florida, then I can basically, it, it's kind of a, a write-off. Like you're basically paying for uh, getting out of the snow. I suppose yeah, no, snow. totally. I mean, I did the same thing in the summer because I had to get out of my house because I was so sick of being in my house because of the pandemic. And, you know, we drove all the way to Maine at our family cabin and we had someone house sitting, like all they had to do, it was a college student. So, you know, all they had to do was pay utilities. And I'm, I was sure my house was looked after. I was able to, you know, be able to just go live in this other place that was free because it belonged to our family. And so it is, it's, it's, it really helps like the mental state, right. To get like, it's just like what you said about, you know, shaking it up, giving yourself like this like, you know, new perspective when you go to your day job and then you suddenly become creative. It's like you have to move your location sometimes to be able to shake that up as well. Yeah, new environment, totally. And I, and I would rent out my house. I, t I did it in the past, but it's like uh, now with these two kids, like it's just, I, I don't know, I'm weirded out with strangers being in their room. I don't know what it is. <laughs> so I just don't want to rent out my primary residence. I, I leave the renting out to the, the income properties. You know what I mean? No, I totally get that. I totally get that. Um, so is there anything, any advice you can give to musicians that have a family, you know, that are now in like their middle age and how they can really balance. And I know you said you, you always try to tuck your kids in at night and you try to stay local. Um, is there any other advice you can give to them? Because sometimes music can be all consuming. I try, especially with the kid thing, I just try to, they're, they're at an age where they're, they're still too young to do anything. So I, I've just shifted things around. So I, if I want to play a bar gig, I used to do the bar gig thing, not for income, as we spoke about earlier, but more for just to get out and hang out and play with my friends <laughs> and you know, have a have a drink on the weekends. But now I've kind of shifted that to, uh, let's just say, doing day gigs on the weekends so that the kids can join. Mm. And that way you're, you're sort of... I spent so many years, like a decade of like missing birthdays and anniversaries and, and all sorts of stuff to a point where people stopped inviting me because they knew it was probably going to be a no on a Friday and Saturday night. So it's nice to actually, uh, you know, be able to, to bring them along for the ride and uh, make them part of the experience. And a lot of people in their thirties and forties, like they're going through the, they're in the trenches right now with these, these young kids. And so, I just sort of made it work with my creativity. I decided to write children's music because it's, I don't know, it's, it's where my creativity took me, but uh, do whatever you feel right. Yeah, no, it was, it was smart. It seems to be doing well. So, and especially in the combination with your, your comedy, like it seems to be really, you know, a, a new zone for you that maybe you happened upon just by accident because that was the situation you were in. Yeah. It's uh it's, it's, it's comedies of it actually that kind of survived a little bit of the pandemic. I mean, it's kind of shut down again now, but like while live music wasn't happening the comedy, they would allow you to walk to the stage with a mask and then you'd be speaking behind plexiglass. And it's really not an intimate feeling. <laughs> like no. you're supposed to try to relate to the, you know, all you can see is yourself and the reflection of this plexiglass. It was a pain in the ass, but like, at least I got to perform in front of an audience during, during the shutdown. Wow. I'm actually surprised they even had that option. That's interesting. But I mean, seriously, like when you haven't been out, it's just great to get out and do something, right? I did a, I did a, uh, 
a drive-in show too, which was actually very relieving. Like over the summer, it just felt good to be, I don't know, outside playing. It was to playing to cars, but at least, it, you know, <laughs> at least you're on a stage, right? There were people in the cars. Yes. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, this has been really great. I appreciate your different perspective on, you know, being a professional musician and how you can really balance that with the other things in your life. Is there any parting advice that you would offer to musicians who are maybe in that, like in that stuck point, like, I really don't love my job. I really want to do music, but I just don't know. I'm kind of stuck. The questions I often get guys on the balanced artist podcast, I kind of I, I ask them question or send, I have to get them to send in questions so that I could try to give them as much value as possible. And the ones that come in often are from two completely different sides. There's like the right side, which is like, I'm, I'm doing music full time. I got to figure out how to make money. <laughs> you be, can you give me your ride home? Because I, I my bus, my bus transfer is about to expire. Mm-hmm. Then the complete other side, it's like these people with the jobs and the families and they, they, they're frustrated because they, they want to do the art, but they, they don't know where to start. And, and they have these self-limiting beliefs and they look at the people on the other side to think I'll never be as good as them. So how am I supposed to compete with that? Well, you don't have to just try to be different. There's a market for everything. It's like, oh, I'm a mom of two or three kids. Like no one wants to hear my perspective. We, everyone's a mom of two or three kids. Like there's so many people want to hear your perspective. I think Beyonce is a mom with two kids. I've like, made my entire career, like a lot of my career speaking and singing for mom's groups. So they're definitely, so you're a perfect example, yes. right? So <laughs> there's clearly a demographic when I do my stuff in the comedy clubs, like I'll do, I, I'll go into a room full of 20 year olds and my parenting jokes land pretty flat, but put me in the same room with a bunch of 40 year olds and they'll piss themselves by the end of the night. Right. So it's, there's an audience for everything. And uh, everybody wants to hear what you have to say from your own perspective. You don't have to be better than that perceived full-time artist. Just try to be different. Love it. I love that. Thank you so much, Rory. I really appreciate this different perspective today. Can you let them know first of all, how to find your podcast and then how to connect with you online? Yeah. Balanced Artist Podcast is on all streaming platforms. If you listen to podcasts, if you're listening to this one, you probably know how to find a podcast. Anyway, <laughs> so <laughs> there's that. You know, on Instagram, you can find me at Rory Gardner Music. Uh, same thing on Facebook. Great. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at RondiFay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.